All right, Tennis Channel Inside In now welcomes on to the show. It's been about a year, uh, far too long. That's totally on me, but uh, one of the best coaches this game's seen, a uh, premier player in his own right, and now a reoccurring official because it's been yearly, you know, regular guest on this podcast. Paul Anacone joins us fresh from the booth calling matches from the ATP Paris Masters. Paul, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Mitch. I was wondering if I offended you last time. I mean, it's been so long. I was like, golly, what did I say last time? I have to re-listen to it. We have uh, such a deep Rolodex of announcers. I don't want to offend anyone, oh, so I'm trying to share the wealth you. and the I love. I got you. Okay. But every time you get to come on here, it's good. I like to you know, learn a little bit about the game that I'm following, and uh, we've reached the you know, ultimate ending of the season. It's been an eventful year, which it always is. This does feel a little different, I would argue, maybe on the men's side. And I wanted to start with that epic final in Vienna last week, Medvedev and Sinner. To get two players of that caliber to play that type of match, I don't know that it's the most common thing in the world, Paul. Indoor end of the year, Sinner and Medvedev brought it, and Sinner finally gets a win in one of those physical matchups against a guy who had had his number up until this year. Yeah, it's good. Look, whenever you see a power baseliner play uh, one of the best defenders that we have, if not the best, along with Novak, and you see uh, tennis of that quality, it's fun to watch. You know, you yeah. just wonder is Sinner going to be able to find ways often enough to finish points? And he did. It was great tennis, and he's had an amazing year. Getting to the net, right? Like, I don't remember seeing that side of him until this year and credit to the team Darren Cahill the coaches he's worked with the time he's put in that was like the one last thing was all these long epic matches it seemed like he was on the losing side of now he's got a couple tournaments in a row where he's got hardware and he's won those physical matchups yeah he's done a great job and look I know they work extremely hard Darren is one of the best coaches in the business and he's got a great team around them and look, he's gotten better. His tennis game has gotten better. He's always hit the ball big from the back of the court. But like you said, now to add that element to come forward and be comfortable coming forward and finishing, that is a great added asset. What do you think it is? You know, Medvedev just can't seem to defend any of these titles. It's like the one of the weirdest stats I've seen. He has all this hardware, but he can't you know win a tournament twice so far at least. Yeah, I, I, I'm not overly concerned about it. He's one of the most accomplished hardcore players in the world, if not the most. And and I just think it's one of those matches where he lost a narrow one. And he's had such a good mm -hmm. year. He's played a ton of tennis. So I, I think he's doing just fine. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he's got the level back up to where he wants it to be. So I saw the stat. Medvedev has the most wins that a player's had since Nadal in 17. We'll see. You know, I know people have managed schedules. Alcaraz and Djokovic at the top of the rankings missed time. But Medvedev's season, he said it. If it wasn't for the Grand Slam, not failures, but setbacks, this would have been his best year as a pro. Yeah, I mean, look, he, he has had so many titles and so many big match wins. And mm -hmm. these majors, he hasn't mm -hmm. done what he's wanted to do as a whole. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you play that much and you win that much, you're there or thereabouts anyway. So, he, look, he, he's a great player. He knows what he's got yeah. to do, wants to finish the year strong. We've had this discussion, right, what's tennis going to look like when the big three, big four are on their way out. Djokovic is still very much the you know, best player in the world. But it is interesting, right, end of 2023, Pam Shriver said we're starting to get a glimpse on what the future is going to look like. There is a clear top four. Sinner has proven that he's in that 3-4 spot with Medvedev, Alcaraz, and Djokovic. Do you see it that way? Obviously, it's changeable, but there has been a premier four players on tour this year. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually look at it a little differently. I look at a premier two. I think Alcaraz and yeah. Novak are a little bit better than everybody. And then I would <laughs> probably give Medvedev the next tip of the mm -hmm. cap. And then from four... To kind of 12, I <laughs> yeah. think, you know, you can get, you can make an argument that there's a lot of interchangeable sp parts and you could probably go to 15 as yeah. well. So if I'm one of those guys between <laughs> three or four and 15, I'm thinking there's great opportunity for me out there. And I think as a fan, it's exciting. I love watching it. It's very exciting. Uh, the other championship last week I wanted to touch on in the men's game was Felix OJ Aliasim re repeats his tournament title win at Basel, beats Hubie Hercosh, who's on a tremendous run, pushing for the finals. But we were talking about Felix the last couple months. Like, is he going to find rhythm? What's happening here? Is it game? Is it confidence? He looked pretty confident out there, and he went through some tough players in Shevchenko, Runa, and then Hubie to get back in the winner's circle. And you see very quickly what makes him such a special player. Yeah, look, I mean, to me, it's a head-scratcher all year to see him going into Basel with a losing record. It's hard to imagine. The guy is so good. 
And his average level should be way better than it has been this mm-hmm. year. You know, you talk about his, his high levels, high levels off the charts. But to me, yeah. your average level is what happens in the big moments and what you do in big moments. And when he struggled, I didn't think it would drop as much as it's dropped. To, so for me, I think it was 90% mental and 10% tennis. Yes, yeah. we expect him to be back higher up in the rankings where he belongs. And I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, the quote, it's just the powerful one you gave. I don't want to butcher it, so I'll let you fix it. But it's something along the lines of like, you know, you're know, you going to have a handful of great matches and a handful of bad matches and where you are is in the middle. Is that how you Pretty see much, the other yeah. pro tennis I mean, tour? There's a little yeah. bit of garbage and a little <laughs> bit of spectacular stuff. And how good are you on your average day? You know, that's what yeah. makes you up, that adversity, the days where you struggle or if you get yeah. in a slump. Can you still find ways to win? And Felix hasn't yeah. been able to do that as much this year, mm-hmm. but I just think it's a matter of time, and that confidence from last week's going to help. When I first heard that quote, in addition to just completely agreeing with it, I thought, man, does that say a lot about the big three, about the legends of the game? We've got the Sampras's, the Agassiz, that – where they are in the middle, consistently getting it done. In a way, and I know Djokovic just hit 397 weeks at, at number one, some incomparable you know, record. That's almost as important and, and special to me on the outside as the major slams is that week in, week out, he is just getting results, and his baseline game is so special. Yeah, I mean, look, look at what he's done this year. I mean, he's ranked number one in the world. He hasn't hardly <laughs> played at all. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so... You know I, know, I know Alcaraz could finish the year number one. Yeah. He's had a terrific year, but in my opinion, there's no way Novak no, Novak <laughs> shouldn't be number one no matter what. He's won three out of the four majors, got to the right. finals of the other one. So he's my year-end number one anyway. Right. right, one shot almost in that Wimbledon final could have swung the match. And yeah, I, I, I see exactly what you're saying. I think I heard you say something similar on air this week where Alcaraz could very well get a deserved number one ranking, finishing in Paris, finishing the year-end championships, but people all recognize who the best player this year is and who going into 2024 should be at the top of the food chain. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember back in the day coaching Pete Sampras, <laughs> and Pete used to talk to me about that all the time. Sure, you want to win the, you know, do well on the tour and win the big, bigger tournaments, the 1,000s and year and championships, but, you know, he always looked at how the majors kind of unfolded. Mm-hmm. And if you, you know, had a significant number of majors that year, then that was yeah. as good as being number one if someone else didn't. Yeah, just a, a quick note on that. Again, we're offering our condolences to Pete's wife, Bridget Wilson Sampras, uh, what she's going through. Uh, just growing up, I mean, I know you worked with him and her friends with him. My mom's whole side is Greek, so we were big Sampras fans. That was oh, okay. kind of my intro into the game. Okay. There wasn't many Greek athletes, you know, so we had yeah, to latch absolutely. on. Absolutely, that's right. Um, we had to latch on. <laughs> but, you, no, uh, you know, well wishes to her. The Alcaraz quote I wanted to get back to, he said, and he openly, we know he's a good kid and he's very, you know, positive and just says what's on his mind. He said, I'm thinking about Djokovic, like he's on, on my mind. When you've worked with special players, maybe not publicly, but if they echoed those same sentiments, like I'm thinking about this guy that's in my way? Not really, you know. Um, I can remember even with Roger, and Roger obviously had a long history where he struggled with Rafa. Rafa won more, you know. And, yeah. But, you know, we would talk about it, but it never was that myopic. You know, mm-hmm. it was always about the macro. And that's one of the things, and I think that's part yeah. of youth yeah. I think that's part of being youthful for Alcaraz because Novak's the best player in the world, so sure he's <laughs> going to be focused on him. But as he continues to play, and even already when you watch him schedule, you see his ability to look at the big picture. So sure, it gives him a target yeah. to emulate and to look at, but I think I think uh, Alcaraz and Juan Carlos Ferro do such a good job at looking at the macro that they're going to focus on the big picture and they know that that journey is going to have Novak in front of them for the time being. Yeah, the age the age gap is a big point in this. We haven't really seen this before, right? Where it's usually guys within a couple years or like a crossing in the night, maybe five, six-year difference, but this is a pretty sizable age gap, and uh, it is a target to focus on. And just on Alcaraz, I know he's playing his first match today as we record this. How do you think he can better? And the big picture is, is definitely on his mind. But finish these years strong, not be hampered with injuries like last year. Hopefully finish strong so we can enter into Australia with some momentum. Yeah, that's the thing. How how does he, to me, when you're that athletic and you're that young, you have to be really careful because you're asking your body to do things that it hasn't done before at the highest level. Mm -hmm. And he's had a couple little injuries already. So I'm sure the people around Mm -hmm. him are monitoring how much (laughs) he's playing. When is he getting his rest and recovery? How's he taking care of his body? 
and it seems really good. But the first few years are just a journey to kind of yeah. figure those things out, and that's what he's trying to do right now. Was that the first thing as he's gotten to this elite level that stood out to you from your coaching hat, which is athleticism? Yeah, I mean, to me, I just – when I watched yeah. him initially, I just have never seen a kid that young that's so good in all the different areas of the game. And, mm-hmm. and you know, Sampras had a huge serve, was a great server and a good forehand. Agassi was an unbelievable returner and great baseline game. You know, you, you I, I never saw anyone that could play at this level, backcourt, forecourt, lateral tennis, north-south, offense, defense, drop shots to bring his opponents yeah, in. Yeah. You know, I mean, he can do everything. And when you have someone that's that young – that's able to execute so many different things. To me, the most shocking thing was how rarely he makes bad shot selection decisions. Because yeah. the hardest thing when you have that many clubs in your golf bag, <laughs> so to speak, is when do you pick which club? And yeah. he does that incredibly well. Yeah, it's there's not many more. There's not You can't really be too hyperbolic with him. Like He's just no, that just, good. No. <laughs> like it, it's, just, it is. It's insane. Mm-hmm. But I like seeing some of these young guys challenge him. And before we move on to other topics... You know, Holger Runa didn't have a great year understatement after Wimbledon. He's still trying to make the ATV finals. It's a race with Hubie. You look at what's happening off court, bringing in Boris Becker. Do you think that could, and not to get into the X and O's of what the tactics might be, but just ignite something with him or maybe be a good sign that he's working with the legend of the game? Well, I think it's a good sign. Look, you know, Boris you know, has so much historical um, information and all, also so much experiential experiential information that's huge um now so much of the coaching from my experience has been about the conversation and communication between the two so i I don't know how that's Mm -hmm. going to unfold but looking on paper it should be uh, it should be a great addition to his Mm -hmm. team i know his mom's a really strong figure in the picture and has done an unbelievable job in helping thus far now it's a matter of putting the jigsaw puzzle right. together a little bit. So right. when you look at it face value, it should be incredible added value to his team. Now it's just about letting it take root for, root for a little bit and let their yeah. relationship grow. Even if it's like managing his schedule, and like we talked about with Alcaraz, getting your body primed up. I know he won Paris last year, but he's been hampered with injuries. There's been a lot of mileage already on him. It wasn't too long ago where we were putting maybe him in that four or five spot as a guy that could contend for slam. So I think the game's there, and you know he knows that he can compete at this level. So it's going to be a fun race. I mean, Hubie, what he's done to put himself in this position is pretty remarkable, too. All the tennis he's played. He won that match against Corda this morning where it's, he's not making the finals if he loses. So those two guys battling out for the last spot with a lot on the line. No, it's amazing. It's amazing. Hubie's uh, one of the best <laughs> indoor players for sure in the world and one of the best players in the world. And what he did in Shanghai and then getting to the finals in Basel, he's hit his stride and he's a hard worker. And so I think the energy is still there. And if it's not, the emotional possibility yeah. of what might happen mm-hmm. will be there to help push him this week. More with Paul Anacone here on Tennis Channel Inside In, talking men's tennis as we gear up for the final weeks of the season. In the middle of the ATP Paris, some unfortunate news with Taylor Fritz this morning, uh, pulling out of the ATP Paris Masters uh, with the ab injury. Talked about it a little bit in his interview with Prakash Armitraj on Tennis Channel yesterday. Paul, it's a heartbreaking end of the season for him. I know you've worked with him hands-on as one of his coaches, but it was a guy who obviously prioritized finishing strong, getting back to the finals where he had such a strong showing last year. Unfortunately, when your body tells you these this thing and gives you these signs, you have to listen to it. Yeah, the biggest challenge is, like, you know, like everything else in life, I think, is letting go of what you can't control. I mean, there was no negligence or no malintent, no poor preparation that mm-hmm. caused the injury, injuries happen. And, yeah. and so it's sure it's heartbreaking. And Taylor put a ton of pressure on himself to try to get back to the year end finals again this year. And looks like it's not going to mm-hmm. happen. And that's okay. That's life. Yeah. You know, life goes on and, and maybe there's some lessons to be learned and some positive things to think about. This does give him some time to rest, recover, and yep. then have a, a really, really good push in the off season. So we'll see how he handles that. But right now, it's just about kind of heart heartbreak and trying mm-hmm. to figure out how to get past it. We we know that he would do everything. We saw the Wimbledon return a couple of years ago, where he came back well ahead of schedule. Like he's going to do everything in his power. We all know that. How would you evaluate this year? Because on one hand, maybe the results consistently weren't there. I did feel like in some of the majors, he kind of had a little bit of a breakthrough. He got to certain points, could have won more matches, but U.S. Open finally got on a little bit of a run. How would you evaluate Taylor's 2023? Yeah, I think he had a, I think he had a terrific year. I think the hardest thing for a young player 
is the sophomore year after getting mm-hmm. in the top 10 or the top five, whatever that yeah. elite level is, <laughs> yeah. it's really hard to back it up. And he came very close this year. I mean, he's yeah. going to finish there, thereabouts anyway. So yeah. to me, to see him back that up and, you know, and to win the titles that he's won and to play such good tennis. And like you said, played well at the U S open played really well mm-hmm. getting to the quarters before losing the Novak. Um, and, and I think that, you know, I, I, I think that he's hitting the ball extremely well. Now mm-hmm. it's about trying to understand kind of periodizing his yeah. schedule so that he plays his best tennis in the big events. It's right. tough to do that, right. but you have to give yourself the best chance. But look, I think Michael Russell's doing an unbelievable job coaching him. He's a terrific coach um, and knows all there is to know about mm-hmm. forehands, backhands, and how to manage schedule. And he's really done a great job with Taylor. And also yeah. Wolf, his his physio is awesome. So he's he's got right. a good group with him on the road, and then when we're here in LA, yeah. we get some good work done. So I think next year's right. gonna be a big year. I don't know if you saw the interview with Prakash on the desk yesterday, uh, where he talked about wanting to be a better decision maker on the court, and he said, and I'm just curious your reaction to this. He's like, even if I'm wrong, I, I got to be pulling the trigger faster. I can't be indecisive out there. Yeah, no, I mean the biggest the biggest takeaway is be clear and committed. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's one of my biggest mantras is is you know know your identity know your game and in the big Mm -hmm. moments do what you do best and if you lose you're losing (laughs) on your terms so that's okay yeah i'd rather see anyone lose on their terms than do something that they're not really is in their wheelhouse Mm -hmm. so i I think he gets that and he understands it and he is look he's one of the best mental players out there Mm -hmm. so i think that that's probably his one of his biggest assets so he learns and he's gotten better and he will continue to get better Last thing on Taylor, did anything surprise you at that French Open reaction with the crowd? <laughs> no, yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, you know, I under, it's, it's all emotion. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. all emotion, and Taylor's an emotional yeah. person, so I totally understood yeah. what he did. Wouldn't have been my first choice because <laughs> yeah. you have to go back out and play again. Yeah. So that that was uh, too bad that that, that that happened because you have to go play another match. But, look, I totally get it. He was yeah. so ramped up and amped up, and it, I was out there. It was so loud. It was yeah. really hard to play. And he did a great yeah. job getting through that match. So totally understand. That. No, I mean, I loved it. And I know a lot of yeah. American sports fans love that. And it was just, yeah. uh, he made a lot of new fans that day, at least yeah. in this country, maybe not over there. Yeah. And when you look at 2023 and kind of stick with the American theme, would you put kind of the emergence arrival of Ben Shelton on one of the top storylines? Because I feel like it has to be at least mentioned at the short list. Sure. And no, he's done an unbelievable job first year at a college tennis playing at such mm-hmm. a high level so well. Um, yeah. I, I think when you have weapons like he does and you're an athlete like him, you know, the transition is there for the taking and he took sure. it. You know, he's done a great job with the huge lefty serve, the big forehand and the ability to disrupt. And I think his self-belief and the energy has yeah. really been kind of the catalyst to him getting to where he is. Would you say technically he looks like a different player? I think I would from Australia to now. It looks like he is playing at a much higher, more consistent he level. He has been playing a more consistent yeah. level the last, I think, few weeks or last yeah. month and a half or so. Right. I think the middle of the year he struggled mm-hmm. a little bit, <clears throat> which I think is normal, too, mm-hmm. for a player getting familiar with some yeah. new foot footing. And um, But look, he has such a high ceiling. I think there's mm-hmm. more great stuff to come. It's just a matter of keeping putting the work in, and he'll do that. That stat of four Americans in the top 15, first time in 26 years. I know that made you smile when you read it. I don't know when you saw it. but Yeah, it no, it was great. Yeah. Look, and I, I, you know, I think that there can yeah. be more. I think yeah. Seb Korda can, can get up in there. Um, I think there's a couple other young guys and, and people, you know, look, Riley hasn't even played. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of possibility. And some of those guys, I won't be surprised when uh, they get into the top 10 because they're yeah. all top 10 talent and and let's see what they do also tommy paul i've been so impressed with what he's done this year i think brad stein is one of the best coaches out there and he's really gotten uh tommy to buy into a philosophy about who he is as a tennis player and tommy's done an amazing job in terms of decision making and also becoming more professional and you see it in so many matches. It's been fun to watch. We see this process, right? Like how long it does take. You know, we're in a society where everyone wants what they want right away. But right. you know from the coaching side, it's not, Rome wasn't built in a day. These players that you mentioned, I mean, Shelton's been working with his dad his whole life, obviously. But it's taken time to really hone their game and, and put it together brick by brick. Yeah, it does take time. And there are ups and downs. And a lot, a lot of the transition for the young players is what happens during that adversity. You know, for someone like Ben, who is so great in college, mm-hmm. what happens now? in the Because there's going to be some adversity. Yeah. And he saw <laughs> a little of it this year and then had a great U.S. Open, then started to play well again. Mm-hmm. So. You know, players that play this much have to get used to losing. 
Right. You, know, you have to figure yeah. out how to lose yeah. without it rattling you. And that yeah. that's an art and a skill in and of itself. And the best players do that because they realize you're going to lose. Yeah. And so you just go through it and you figure out how to not let it rock your confidence. Well, I want to finish up talking about this ATP Paris Masters. There's been a lot of exciting matches already. I didn't think they acknowledged time zones or night sessions. You know, Stan and team. It was like Lionel Richie all night long out oh there. Oh, my gosh. Just insane. Uh, that was a crazy match. Good for team to win that one to get through. You also have, you know, Demon Hour beating Andy Murray. Unfortunate, you know, a great match, epic, a lot of fight out there. But Murray was pretty blunt, Paul, in his post-match comments, saying, I'm going to have to, you know, think about this. The end of the season, i got to figure out what I'm, you know, what I'm trying to accomplish in these next few years. It's a question that, unfortunately, a lot of pro athletes, tennis players included, have to ask. They do. You have to wonder why you play. Look, he loves to compete. You know, yeah. that's one of the things he absolutely loves to, he was one of the best competitors <laughs> I've ever seen in anything. You know, Roger Federer loved to compete, but mm -hmm. he loved to play more than he loved to compete. Yeah, yeah. And so there's, you play for different reasons and Andy needs to figure it out and he will. And he, I, to my opinion, my opinion, you give <laughs> um, the great players yeah. carte blanche to figure out why they want to play and if they want to play. And, and when you're that close to, you know, look, Demonor's top 15 in the world, and Andy <laughs> should have won that match, and he should have beat him in Beijing as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, it just shows you how narrow the margins are. So yeah. he's right there. Yeah. But do you want to put yourself through that? And if you do, what can you learn to figure out what to do to actually get better, even mm -hmm. at his age? And I actually think he can. You know, I yeah. think he can become more comfortable and more confident being offensive in big moments. Yeah. He was did a great job from the middle of the second set until the end of the third set being offensive. And then he just just kind of backed off just a little bit, not a ton, just a little bit. But that's all it takes. And then Demonar played some terrific tennis. So, you know, the great thing about sports is no matter how old you are, you can still learn. And Andy's one of the best students of the game. So I'm sure he'll figure out, do I want to torture myself and keep doing this? Yeah. Do I want to learn? Can I get better? What can I do? And is it still fun for me to do it? And yeah. ultimately, at the end of the day, it needs to be fun, and only he knows if he's having a good time. The margins are just so slim at this level. Like it's like you said, it was a couple points backing off just a tad. Demon out raises it, and it could have gone the other way. Um, it, it's remarkable what he's done with his ranking, getting up to like a pretty much recent you know high for what's happened since the hip stuff, and the fact that he's out there playing with a hip that would set off an, a metal detector at an airport. He's just still going so. Uh, props then we hope to see him much much more uh, the rest of this tournament I mean I know Alcaraz starts today Djokovic comes back do you expect those two to make deep runs is there anybody else on the outside that could really threaten that dream final well look let's look at uh, this tournament historically we've had some strange winners in the mm. past right uh, only because well not only because but largely because it's the end of the year there's a lot of stuff going on <laughs> players trying to get into the year in championships. Some players, most players, playing with little nagging injuries right now. Yeah. So you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, to me, Novak should be the freshest. I think he should play his best tennis if he can get a match or two under his belt. Mm -hmm. And Alcaraz said in his press conference that he's not 100%. I don't know what that means, <laughs> mm -hmm. but we'll find out as the tournament progresses. To me, those two guys are the players to beat. But look, it's indoor tennis yeah. and it's Paris. There's a lot that can happen. Yeah, Djokovic staying fresh, not playing any of the Asian swing. I, that must be like a Gen Z thing. I, and I, I'm not saying I disagree with Alcaraz saying I'm not 100%. I don't think many players in your era might have said that publicly. Probably not. I mean, probably <laughs> yeah. not. And he hasn't played that yeah. much lately, so you would think yeah. that he's okay. But it's a long year and it's a young body, so yeah. there's a lot of things that you go through. Holger won this tournament last year. Uh, Djokovic, we know, and and. Where, I guess the one thing final on Djokovic, where would you put his indoor tennis? I know he's great everywhere, but what makes him succeed in special indoor hardcore? He's great on everything, yeah. right? And, and I think the fact that uh, he's done such a great job, and I talked before about getting better, mm -hmm. at getting better that he's great indoors too. Yeah. You know, serving to targets, first strike tennis, the right. ability to return offensively. All these things are just key elements in being mm -hmm. successful indoors. Just goes on to the huge menu of things that Novak does so well. Well, I can't wait to see what happens. Uh, Paul Anacone, this was a blast. Uh, I had to mention, too, you know, I was disappointed I didn't see the statue at Tennessee when I got there. I can't you know? believe it. But it was, was like, there a poster there somewhere? There was a poster. It was like you and Bernard King, I think, just <laughs> yeah, side by right. side. Uh, <laughs> but Knoxville is a fun town. It was my Great first town. time. They beat Texas A&M when I was there for the football game. So it was uh, 
It was very fun to see. Uh, well, we're excited to have you on this podcast. We'll have to do this again less than a year next time. All right. I'm uh, going to hold you to it. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I right. definitely will. Thanks, Paul Anacone, for coming on Tennis Channel Insight, and always a pleasure. Appreciate it. Thanks, man.